This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Well, our scriptural lesson for today comes from Isaiah chapter 58, verse 11 and 12, reading from the New Living Translation of Scripture. Notice there these words. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters do not fail. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. I'm speaking today simply from the, the thought rest and repair. Rest and repair. Rest and repair. Uh, one of the reasons is because our body begins to repair only when we fully rest, when we enter into the rest. But now you cannot rest until you do what you're supposed to do. That's why the scripture t teaches this principle that you labor to enter into his rest. That is to say that if you don't do what you need to do when you need to do it, you're not going to be able to rest well. Now, I don't know about you, but any responsible person, if you have responsibility and you, you've got a job to get done, the way that I'm wired, I don't rest well if, if I haven't finished my assignment. I mean, if, I, if I'm not prepared, I don't rest well. You can't fully enter into a rest until you have done what you need to do. When you need to do it, you labor in order to enter into his rest. So we, we labor so that we can rest. We labor so that we can rest. This, this uh, word, you know, uh, the, 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 the philologist in me, the etymologist in me, uh, brings to bear this, this, this word. It's an old word. It's, it's the word respair. Respair is an old, rare word, meaning the return of hope after a period of despair. Respair. It's an old word. It's an old word. And it means the return of hope after a period of despair. If you've gone through a depression, you've gone through a time of economic recession, you've been laid off, you've had a relationship failure, you've had somebody to die, you, you need respair. You need respair. A return of hope after a period of despair. Hope is, is, is merely expectation of favorable change expectation of favorable change. Whenever uh, your, your life has hope, you, you're expecting things to change in your favor. Hope is always the goal setter for faith. It is the goal setter for faith. Remember, faith is the substance of things hoped for. If you don't have any hope, your faith has nothing to work to achieve. So you have to have hope. And that's why we have to have respair. It, it is, it's this, this restoration, this repairing that happens after a period of, of, of despair. It's the restoration of hope that comes in us. Because we get in really bad shape if you ever lose hope. A hopeless person is a helpless person. A hopeless person is a helpless person. If you lose hope, no one can help you. And that's why if ever there is despair in your soul, we really do have to work to be able to get our hopes up. We really, really do. Respair is a word that is both a noun and a verb. And, and, uh, and it, as a verb, it, it actually means to mend, to repair, to patch, or to rebuild. And it implies making something sound uh, that was broken or something that was torn or injured to actually be restored. So everybody needs rest in order to rebuild and to renew and to refocus. During this time of, uh, of this coronavirus pandemic, it has forced some people into a rest. A rest from 
running and ripping to a whole lot of different social functions and uh, even having to drive into the office. They've had a, a forced rest to come on them. But everybody needs to rest in order to rebuild and to repair. And so as, as God was speaking to us here in Isaiah 58, this, this was a, 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 a chapter that God was dealing with, with something that you, you rarely hear folks talk about even in the church nowadays, sin. But sin is still offensive to God. Sin is willful rebellion against the will of God. It is willful rebellion against God's known will. So uh, where there's sin, and, and, and just because a person redefines something not as sin does not mean that they've changed the definition with God. God is the originator of all things. And just because you start calling something by another name does not mean that you've altered its sin nature in the eyes of God. God is the one who defines sin. I don't have the luxury of editing God's word. I, I don't have that luxury to say what is that this used to be sin, but now that's, that's old fashioned. It's, it's no longer sin anymore. No, no, no. God was dealing with sin there. And he knew that whenever there was sin, that it would cause effects, negative effects in the culture. But everybody needs to, to restore. Everybody needs to rebuild. In, in fact, uh, you, you, you hear the term, uh, the quarantine. Uh, quarantine, actually, it, 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 it comes from an old word, quaranta. It's uh, almost similar in Spanish, quarenta, which, which means 40, 40. Quaranta, quarantine. We get quarantine from this word quaranta. And, and it actually means 40, 40 days because back during the time of the Black Death, the Black Plague that happened back in the 1300s, as ships pulled into Venice, they were required a quaranta there to stay there for 40 days. They had to quarantine in port for 40 days because they've been bringing goods from various other countries in Europe and they didn't want it to spread and so they wanted to make sure that whatever was coming in was not going to spread out of control and and uh, whether you remember this from history or not but it is estimated between 75 million to 200 million people died in this plague 200 million people in the black death of the 1300s so when ships came in came in, they were required to quarantine a quaranta for 40 days. They just had to chill out and rest to make sure that they weren't bringing something in that was going to spread and create further death in their, in their midst. And so it was a way of their quelling this, this terrible plague, a rest. Maybe we quell particular things in our own life, in our own bodies, when we take a, a, a quarantine. That's why God believes in, in, in a Sabbath, and he gave mankind a Sabbath. And I just want to remind you that whenever things seem dark, or whenever things seem down, the proper thing to do, if they are dark or down, shift your focus. Shift your focus. Shift your focus. Well, if you think about it, uh, feeling down is because of focusing on a certain thought or condition. Shift your focus. It's time to get your hopes up. If you're ever feeling dark or down, shift your focus. Go to that happy place in your mind. Go to that place that reminds you of a, of a joy, of something that was a, a blessing to you. You notice uh, scripture, uh, the psalmist, as he was writing in Psalm 42, verse 11 in the New Living Translation, notice what it says. Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. Notice the antidote for that was hope. That's a part of that respair, respair. Of, of bringing hope back to a situation, where there, a situation where there has been great despair. Why am I so discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will shift my focus. I'll shift off of the despair and shift my focus back on God, the things that God has done. When I think about God, it'll cause me to praise Him again. God, my Savior and my God. When I think about the goodness of Jesus... And what he's done for me, when I, when I think of how he has spared me and he didn't give me what I should have deserved, God was good in his mercy and in his grace toward me. When you start thinking about how good God has been to you, 
Not what you're dealing with right now, but shift your focus. Shift your focus. Whenever your life feels down or dark, shift your focus and get your hopes up. Hope thou in God. I like the way that it reads in the message version, the scripture. Notice the, the message version. It says, why are you down in the dumps, dear soul? Why are you crying the blues? Fix my eyes on God. Soon I'll be praising again. He puts a smile on my face. He's my God. You got to shift your focus. Shift your focus. This is not a matter of if you'll ever get down. You will get down sometime, but shift your focus. Shift your focus. Shift your focus. Fix your eyes on God. Think about what God has already done in your life. Think about what, uh, not merely what you have, but sometimes you can rejoice about what you don't have. You can look at other people that have conditions, sicknesses, diseases, uh, a, a terrible spouse and say, you know, Lord, I thank you. Thank you that I'm not married to her. Thank you that I'm not married to him. Thank you, Jesus. You may not even have a spouse, but Lord, thank you. You know, so thank God not merely for what you have. Thank him for what you don't have. When you focus in on God, you fix your eyes on God. It lifts you up above the despair and the depression and the plight of the world because you are judging all times on the, based on the present time. And the present will not always be the way that it, that it is. Your present, every time that you go through a test or a temptation, it's always temporary. Has anybody ever had a permanent test? I haven't. Has anybody ever had a permanent temptation? I haven't. Temptation is always temporary. Temptation is always temporary. If you can breathe through it, if you can shift your focus through it, the temptation will pass. The test will pass pass, you can get through it. Shift your focus. I love something that Masut uh, Barasani said. He said, your future depends on your dreams, so go to sleep. Your future depends on your dreams, so go to sleep. Just go to sleep. You know why? Because sleep is restorative. It is restorative. It is restorative. I love something that Gandhi said about uh, sleep. He said, each night when I go to sleep, I die. And the next morning when I wake up, I am reborn. Because sleep is restorative. Sleep is restorative. E. Joseph Cosman said this, that the best bridge between despair and hope is a good night's sleep. The best bridge between despair and hope is a good night's sleep. Sometimes a good night's sleep will shift your perspective. You may think that you're having a serious problem, but all you need is a good night's sleep. Sometimes you wake up in the morning and you'll just have the answer of what you need to do. You know why? Because while you were asleep, the committee of sleep was working on your problem and you wake up with a knowing in the morning, I know what I need to do now. Somehow sleep is, is, a, is a medicine to it. it. It restores us. It rebuilds us. It refocuses our mind on hope. It's, 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 it's helpful to us. We need it. Sleep allows both the mind and the body to rest and to repair. That's why we have crazy dreams sometimes because your mind is unwinding from everything that's been put in it. It has to, 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 to be activated in a, in a different way. Sleep is involved in the healing and in the repair of your heart and even of your blood vessels. Let me give you a few things that sleep does. Sleep can boost your immune system. Isn't that interesting? I don't care how many vitamins that you take and I don't care how much you exercise. If you don't sleep, your immune system will become impaired. Sleep boosts your immune system. Sleep improves your memory. That's why before you have a standardized test, a child needs to be able to make sure that they have a good night's sleep. It improves your memory. If you didn't sleep well, you have mental fog. It improves your memory. Sleep also increases your exercise performance. You'll have better endurance when you exercise, when you work out, when you've had a good night's sleep. Uh, sleep helps to prevent uh, uh, weight gain. Oh my goodness. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing if you could just, like a bear, just go and hibernate and you wake up and you're 40 pounds lighter? Wouldn't that be something? But it does because uh, if you don't get enough uh, sleep, your body produces all of this cortisol, this, this stress kind of hormone, and it makes your body hold on to weight. It helps prevent weight gain when you can get a good night's sleep. 
It helps to increase your productivity. It helps to produce a better mood in you. There's some people that are cranky and moody because they didn't sleep well. It gives you a better mood because it's rest and repair, rest and repair. And it also helps to decrease inflammation in the body. Again, that's because of that cortisol uh, kind of uh, deal there. So ongoing sleep uh, deficiency is also risk, uh, it's linked to a risk uh, in, in heart disease, kidney disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, and also stroke, just because people don't sleep well enough. And you'll be surprised how many people in the world today have sleep issues where they don't rest well at night. They don't sleep well. No wonder we're sick and stressed out and overwhelmed and burned out. You must either slow down or you will break down. Those are our only choices. You must either slow down and rest or you'll break down. You slow down and rest or you'll break down. And you see that you allow your body and your mind to be restored. You allow them to be restored. But here's the principle that I want you to get. Balance is the key to life. You can't rest all the time. People who rest all the time before they've worked. Resting before you, before you work is called laziness. <laughs> it, it, that's, that's what laziness is. It's resting before you work. So you have to work and then you rest. You, you, you know, God did six days of, cre of creation. He worked for six days. And on the seventh day, God rested. Now listen, if God rested and he's God, how much more do we need to, to rest? I mean, just to be able to have a divine Sabbath. Because what do you do when you wake up tired? You wake up with this sort of malaise about you. You wake up in a funk. What do you do when you, you, you wake up and, and you feel like you've not rested? It is because your soul is tired. And so what do you do? How do you become refreshed when your soul is tired? That's one of the reasons that we have the Word of God and the Spirit of God and prayer and praise and worship because they reinvigorate the human spirit. That's why God said as a part of that Sabbath, worship me. When you do that, you're giving a rest to your soul because it doesn't matter whether you have some type of a, a therapeutic, you know, posturepedic mattress and you can have the best kind of rubber sole shoes. But when is your soul that's tired? You can sit down in a restful chair and be restless. You can lay down on one of the best kind of mattresses and still be restless because it's your soul that's tired, your soul that is weary, your soul that needs to be reinvigorated with a hope. It's where it says, hope thou in God. You've got to shift your focus to say, I need to get back to where I need to get with God. You see, this is about balance. It's about balance. Balance is the key to life. Balance is the key to life. Balance is the key to life. And a lot of people don't understand it. If you get ready to make a cake, it's about having uh, flour and eggs and milk and vanilla extract and sugar and butter. All of these things. But listen, when you say balance, balance does not mean equal portions. You don't put as much egg in as you put flour. You don't put the same amount of, of, of milk as you do vanilla extract. It, it's, it's, uh, it has to be balanced according to the appropriate measure of it. It's not an equal distribution. So when you talk about having a balanced life, it doesn't mean that you work the same amount of hours that you rest or that you, you eat the same amount of hours. It's not an equal distribution. It is the proper mixture and combination of it. Like you have to have, you know, you make iced tea, it has to be balanced to where the tea is brewed to a certain strength. It has to be brewed for a certain strength or else it'll be weak tea and you can't fix weak tea. You balance it with sugar. You balance it with lemon. You have to balance it. It doesn't mean equal portion. You don't put as much lemon juice as you put water. So it has to be balanced. It means a contributing part to have it balanced. So when you talk about leading a balanced life, it's not equal time to all things. It is the appropriate amount of each element that strikes the, just the right type of balance, just the right amount of salt, just the right amount of sugar, just the right amount of butter. It is the balance of these things that's working in your life. But when you get too much bitterness at one time, it can so turn your stomach. If you get too much 
red pepper, too much hot spicy stuff. It will tear you up and burn you going in and coming out. It's so the key to life is balance. The key to life is balance. It is balance. It is balance. The key to life is balance. And God knows how to balance the bitter with the sweet. Life is a mixture of both the bitter and the sweet. It's bittersweet, but it can actually become quite delectable to us when we realize what's happening. But when it's your soul that's tired, you need a Sabbath. When it's your soul that's tired, you need a Sabbath. Someone asked a, a Jewish rabbi, how is it that the Jews have been able to so successfully keep the Sabbath all of these centuries? And the Jewish rabbi responded, it is not the Jews who have kept the Sabbath. It is the Sabbath that has kept the Jews. And when you realize that honoring God's Sabbath brings a renewal, a rest, a, a respair, respair, renewing even of the hope after a long period of despair has happened in the life. And I want you to understand this about rest. Rest is not always inactivity, but a change of activity. People go on vacation to have a rest from what they normally do at work vocationally. And uh, have you ever gone on vacation and you've done so many activities that you needed to rest for two days after you got back from vacation? Because it's not inactivity, it is a change of activity. When you just don't have to deal with the same people and the same drama and the same responsibilities and you have a change of activity, that actually is a rest to your mind. It can be a rest to your soul. It's not always inactivity. Rest is oftentimes a change of activity. We rest on the Sabbath, but worship can be quite active. It's just a change of activity. And I, I love something that, that my, uh, I'm the namesake of, Dale Carnegie. He says, if you can't sleep then get up and do something instead of lying there worrying. It's the worry that gets you, not the lack of sleep. Isn't that interesting? I can't tell you the number of times that I've had that because there are times that when you're carrying a hope on the inside of you, when you're carrying a dream, when you're pregnant with purpose, uh, uh, you know, a, a dream, uh, uh, you've heard me teach, is not something that you see in your sleep. A dream is something that keeps sleep from you. Because when you really possess a dream, you don't honestly possess the dream. The dream possesses you. So the dream will wake you up at 1.38 in the morning and say, oh, get up, let think about me. Hey, hey, hey. The, the, the dream will just wake you up uh, sometimes at, 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 at 2.47. And, and it'll say, hey, 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 I'm getting ready to throw some ideas over to you. You, you can lay there if you want to, but you will not go back to sleep because I'm talking. And your dream down on the inside of you will be talking to you at 2.47 in the morning. And it's like, can't we, can't we discuss this at, at 9, 9.30? But your dream will wake you up at 3.38 in the morning. And your dream will start talking to you. And say, think about me. Hey, 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 hey. It, it'll just throw your idea. It'll just hit you upside the head. It's not going to wait for you to, to, to get your catcher's mitt on. It'll just start throwing, your, uh, throwing things there. And so... Uh, it's a, it's a good idea to keep a, 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 a recording device by your bed, something to be able to write things down because the principle is, is on the paper out of the mind. On the paper out of the mind. There are people, if there are things that, that's on your mind about your work before you get ready to go to bed at night, put it down on the paper. Put it on the paper because, see, you carry this psychological weight on you that uh, I, I don't want to forget this. I don't want to forget this. Well, if you write it down, you don't have to have that worry of it nagging in the in the back corners of your mind that I need to call so and so write your to to do list out the night before that's 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 how you do it never start a day until you have it finished finish it the night before finish it the night before and you put it on the paper it's out of the mind I don't have to carry this so you put it there and if you can't rest if you're in the bed at nighttime get up and do something it's not the lack of sleep that always takes you out. It's the worry. It's the worry that will make you look old before you get old. It's worry. It's worry. Worry is the thing that keeps the people from sleep. Get up and do your job. As I said, until you do your labor, you can't fully rest. You got to do your part. You got to do your part. You've got to do your part. And, and, and I'm telling you, there's nothing that helps you to rest as well as being prepared. You do your job and get prepared. 
and then you can rest. When you know, Lord, I've done everything I can do, it's on you now. It's on you. It's on you, Jesus. But you can't just at the beginning of it and just say, Lord, it's on you. And the Lord said, no, no, no. You train up a child in the way he should go. No, it's on you. And you can't throw that back to God. You, do, you will be up all night long with your child. Stressed out over your children. Stressed out over your marriage. If you haven't done what you need to do. But after you've done all you can do, God will bring a peace in you to say, you know what? I've already dealt with that. I've done everything that I've known to do. I've been kind. I've prayed about it. I've sought the Lord about it. I've done everything that I know to do. Jesus, I turn this over to you now. It's in your court now. It's in your court, Lord. I've done everything that I know to do now. Turn it over to him and refuse to take it back. Every time the thought of that thing comes, just say, you know what? Uh, devil, I have already put this in the hands of Jesus. If you want to discuss it now, you've got to talk to him about that. It's his. It's his. So when you get tired, learn to rest, not to quit. Learn to rest. Whenever you get tired, learn to rest, not to quit. And this is the thing that I want you to understand is that sin, sin, God is talking to them in this 58th chapter of Isaiah about sin. Sin creates an unrest in human beings. Sin creates an unrest. How do we know that? You can look at Isaiah chapter 48, verse 22. There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. Peace is a rest. If you can't have any peace in your soul, you can't rest. There's no rest for the wicked. There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. When you uh, do wicked things, you can't rest. And so God has, a, he has an antidote uh, for that if you've got the sin because the sin creates unrest in us. Isaiah chapter 58 verse 1, notice this, cry aloud, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet and declare to my people their transgression to the house of Jacob, their sin. Do you think that God says, you know, lift up your voice like a trumpet, cry loud and spare not, just so that we can point out people's sin and make people feel bad about their sin? Absolutely not. Uh, this is not uh, an encouragement for us to just make people feel bad about themselves. That's not the purpose of, of pointing out and, and making a person aware that something is a sin before God. It is so that they become self-aware. If you're not self-aware then you cannot change. Awareness is the beginning of change. Awareness is the beginning of change. Awareness. If a person is not aware that they need to change, they will never change. So the law of God brings to us the knowledge of sin and it reveals to us our desperate need of God and of his grace and his mercy. It's not to make a person feel bad about where they are, but it's, uh, it is to clearly bring to the person the understanding you are not enough. That we fail when we are left to ourselves. That there is no good thing that is in the flesh. That, that human hearts turn themselves toward wickedness, particularly when God is not involved in their life. That we, left to ourselves, become a detriment to ourselves. So when God talks about lifting up your voice and crying loud against sin, it is to help us to realize our wretchedness and our desperate need of God so that we will go to God and say, God, help me. God, help me. So that we realize our desperate need of a Savior and our need to change. I need to change because you cannot teach a person a lesson that they think they already know. So it is to say, listen, we've got issues. We've got problems. We are displeasing to God. If you're living in sin, you need to know that you're in sin because if, you don't, if you're not aware that you're in sin, you'll never repent. And if you never repent, you can never be saved. But when we honestly repent, then things change. And I'm just here to announce to you that it's prayer time. It's prayer time. It's prayer time. And things have gotten so severe now in our land that it's not merely prayer time. It's fasting time. It's fasting time. And it's healing time. I want you to understand this principle very clearly. That unresolved wounds are magnets for demonic infiltration. Because demons love hiding in hurt spaces that you haven't allowed God to heal. I would snapshot that if I were you. But unresolved wounds, they are magnets for demonic infiltration. Demons love hiding in hurt spaces that you haven't allowed God yet to heal. So you have to be very careful about that because it's, a, it's an open door. It's a portal 
trauma is a portal to demonic Ill infiltration. And if you got unresolved wounds, whether it came from your childhood and a mother and a father or somebody bullying you that then created a wound and then it becomes a magnet now for demonic infiltration because demons love to hide in hurt spaces that you haven't allowed God to heal. That's why we've got to be healed. That's why we've got to be restored. That's why it's prayer time and fasting time and healing times. And you have to realize this is why the Bible says guard your heart with all diligence. Guard your heart. Guard your heart so that it doesn't get infected. Infected. Uh, because uh, when the, the, the real way to, to guard your heart is to qualify the people that you give access to your heart. You have to qualify the people that you give access to your heart. And then you have to realize that whenever some people get bound by drugs and alcohol and sex addictions and all of these kinds of things, there are some of those kinds of strongholds, hear me carefully by the Spirit, that can only be broken by the power of fasting. That can only be broken. You know why? I've discovered it's because hunger is the first element of self-discipline. Because if you can control what you eat and drink, you can control practically everything else. Hunger is the first element of self-control. And so sometimes you actually have to cut back so that you can move forward. And this is what fasting is about. Fasting is about cutting back so that you can honestly move forward. It's about cutting back so that you can honestly move forward. So sometimes it's, it's about fasting from the right kinds of things. Let me show you a little difference between just like a, a, a nickel and a dime. Put that little meme up and let them, let them see that. You see that? Now, here's a, here's a prophetic message that I want you to see about this. Am I preaching about money? No. But you, you see, a nickel is twice the size of a dime, but half the value. Now, here's what I want you to see. That oftentimes, you have to have a smaller circle. You have to decrease the size of your circle in order to increase your value. And sometimes people think that the more people that you know, it's not about how many, it's about what kind. And so you've got to shrink the size of your circle, have a smaller circle, you increase your value. It's not how many people you know, it's who you know. It's the caliber of people that you need to know. You don't need to know everybody that you think you know. And please don't, don't delude yourself into thinking that all of the people that follow you on social media are your friends. Please don't get your idea of how large your friendship circle is by who follows you on Facebook and social, uh, you know, uh, Instagram and TikTok and, uh, you know, all of the, whatever uh, form of social media that you might use because that's a delusion. If you really think that those are your friends, just, just tell all of them, send me $5. And see how many responses that you get. That, that'll, that'll show you your friends. And so you sometimes need to make your circle smaller in order to increase your your value. Sometimes this is about fasting. So uh, what do you need to fast from? What do you need to fast from? What do you need to fast from? And then here's a second question. Who do you need to fast from? You know that there are some people that whenever you're with them, whenever you talk to them, they produce stress in you. Your cortisone levels go all through the roof because you're talking. So you just see their, their call, their, their number, coming up on your phone or text message coming from them and, and it just produces stress in you because you know they want something. You know that they're perhaps narcissistic and they just want something and, and you're just trying to filter through, oh, hey, Carol, how you doing? Hey, how you? You know, you're just waiting on them to, for them to hit you up for the real reason that they call. They're not calling to check on you. And, and, and so you know that. So sometimes it is about decreasing your size and in the process of that, you realize that you increase your value. So I want you to notice the kind of fast that God recognizes and ordains. Isaiah chapter 56, verse 6 through 10, notice this. Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice? If you ever thought that God was not concerned about justice, read your Bible. And what you will always find, practically every time in Scripture that you find righteousness, righteousness and justice go hand in hand. There is no such a thing as being righteous and unjust. 
Righteousness and justice go together. Is God concerned about social justice? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is he concerned when human beings are being oppressed and taken advantage of, no matter what race they are or income level that they are or nationality that they are, when people, human beings, are being taken advantage of? God is a God of justice and he's concerned about justice issues. And so is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen, God says, to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke? To set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked to clothe them and to not turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will bring forth like the dawn. It will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. God heals us through fasting. You see animals that get sick, they'll start, stop eating, they'll fast and, uh, and until their healing springs forth. He says your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. God says, I got your back, your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. See, when you pray, you break through that, the dead cats that's on the line. And he says, then you'll call me. After you've gone through the, the fasting and you've broken these yokes off of you, then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. And he says, if you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and the malicious talk, the malicious talk, and if you spin yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noon gate. God says, I'm going to turn your your midnight into morning. I'm going to turn the darkness into light. You're going to come out of that. I'm telling you, one of the best therapies for depression is to open up your door and go across the street and help somebody else. Whenever you become a blessing to somebody else, you increase your own joy. And I'm just here, this, this scripture here reminds us that God is a restorer. God is a restorer. Don't ever question that. God is a restorer. He's talking about being a a repairer of the breach. His anointing is on those that helps to restore and to bring order and to bring justice. God is a restorer. I want you to notice what he says in Joel chapter 2 verse 25. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. Can you imagine that God says, I will restore to you the years? Only God can restore time to you. God says, I will restore the years. I want you to listen to this very carefully. God didn't say, I will restore the stuff. I will restore the years. See, you can make more money. You can get more material stuff, but you don't get any more time. But when you serve God, and if you will humble yourselves in repentance before God and let your heart, the things that break God's heart also break your heart so you can love what God loves and hate what he hates. If you'll ever get your heart right with God, God says, then, 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 I will restore to you the years. I'll pull back years off of your life. I'll give you a new invigoration of energy. I I will restore the years. I will restore to the years. You'll feel a a, a new youthfulness, a new vitality happening on the inside of you. You see, the Bible teaches that though the outward man perish, the inward man is renewed day by day. The inward person, the hidden man of the heart, God says, I'm going to renew that. And I I, want to be able to have a young mind and and, and young thoughts and young ideas and young dreams and young imaginations and and young endeavors. I want to be able to have the energy of God. I don't want to just be a, a gray-haired man thinking old types of ideas of just sitting on the porch and sipping iced tea. I want to be alive and vibrant and experiencing this earth in a way that God intended for us to be able to experience. It's like God, don't do anything in the earth without me, God. If you're going to do something in the earth, God, don't do it without me. Use me for your glory. Count me in on it, Lord. If I can pray, if I can help somebody, if I can prepare a meal and take it to somebody, if I can help somebody else clean up, 
if I can give advice to somebody, if I can share wisdom with somebody or encouragement, if I can lay my hands on somebody and watch the supernatural power of God move through me, if I can lift somebody's day who's been depressed, somebody who feels unloved and unwanted, and you can somehow embrace them in a way that lets them know I know you, I care about you, I value you, I treasure you, you're important to God. If you can set somebody on something that God sees more in you than what you see in yourself, and this is not the end, that God has bigger plans for you. And if you'll just trust him, God will walk you out of that storm and bring you into a blessed and delightful place. But only God can restore time in your life. Only God. I want you to notice this in, in St. John chapter 9 and verse 31. Now we know, not we guess, that God does not hear sinners. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. God does not hear sinners. Did you know that was in the Bible? That God does not hear sinners? Well, then if he doesn't hear sinners, how can a sinner get saved? So, with that in mind, when the Bible says that God does not hear sinners, in John 9, 31, it is to qualify that the sinners are people who pray selfish prayers. You know what the sinner prays? The reason that God does not hear a sinner's prayer, I believe is because sinners constantly ask God for a better life when they pray. You know, God, I want this house. God, I want this car. God, I want these shoes and this pocketbooks and these eyebrows and God, if you just help me to get this, if you'll help me to get into this neighborhood, if you help my child to get into that school. They're always asking God to change things in their life, but they fail to ask God to change them. Lord, heal my mama. Heal my daddy. Heal so and so. They want God to do stuff for them that will alter things for their benefit. They want everything in their life altered except them. To where they can still live however they want to live according to their own truth and not according to God's truth. And God is saying, listen, I don't even hear that. I don't even hear that. The prayer of the sinner that God hears is the one where the sinner is beating on his own chest and saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Have mercy on me. Save me. Jesus, I need you. Change me. Don't change the circumstances of my life. Don't change the possessions in my life. Jesus, I need you to change me. And I'm just here to remind you today, stop asking God to change your life without asking God to change you. Stop asking God to change your life without asking God to change you. Because if God changes your life, Without changing you, you carry the stench of your own life into a new situation. You're asking God for a new beautiful couch because the old one is stinking. And you don't realize is that you are the one who carried the stench to that couch. And you'll do the same to a new one. So God is saying, don't ask me for a new couch until I'm able to wash and change you. Because the couch won't matter. It'll be a matter of time before that situation will stink just like the previous one. God is saying, I want to change you. So when we ask God, God change me, purify my heart. That's when God will step in and begin to do something brand new in us. I want you to imagine with me for just a moment that you are the Dutch artist Rembrandt who painted this, one of the world's most beloved paintings. It was called The Return of the Prodigal Son. And that distinguished painting sits today in the uh, Hermitage Museum in uh, St. Petersburg, Russia. The Return of the Prodigal Son. And it's an interesting painting showing the prodigal son coming and the father embracing him in some people in the background observing this whole interaction. 
And I want you to just think about it just for a moment. Rembrandt, who lived back in, I don't know, around the 1300s or so. A masterful painter, just hanging there in their museum there in St. Petersburg. And imagine some drunks who came by the museum one night and said, hey, man, let's, let's, break, let's break into this place. After a night of revelry and drinking and partying, they just want to do damage to something. And they said, yeah, we're going to just mess up some of these old boring pictures here. And they come to the Rembrandt, the return of the prodigal son. And they take it off the wall and throw it on the floor. One of them reaches into his pocket and takes a knife and slits it diagonally from one frame to the other corner of the frame. And then another pours beer on it. And the little fizz and carbonation of the beer starts to discolor some of the colors on the canvas. Then another stamps on it with his muddy boots and grinds it in. And can you imagine the curators of this museum when they come in the next day and to see the Rembrandt on the floor, defaced, devalued, and wondering, what is this? Why is this? And they're like, what was priceless is now useless. And so their idea would come to say, hey, Let's just auction it off for whatever little bit that we can get. And a group of auctioneers come in to start bidding on it. And they're just bidding pennies on the dollar of what it was worth. And can you imagine if Rembrandt was, st was still alive and if, they, if he said, no, 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 I'm going to send my representative here, but I want you to go in and I want you to bid full value on the painting. And can you imagine the Rembrandt? Torn, defaced by beer, mud, something that was once priceless and now it has been so defaced and devalued. And yet while others were bidding pennies on the dollar and Rembrandt, let's imagine that his person says full value and they sell it to him and now they bring it back to Rembrandt. And now he's looking at his masterpiece. I believe that this was the last piece that he painted before he died. And he takes a fine thread and sews it from corner to corner to repair the breach. The thread being so fine that it was almost imperceptible to the human eye. And then from memory, his taking his colors and matching the hues by memory of what color was on the cheek and the hair and the robe of the individuals. And he fixes what the beer fizz bleached out. And then he takes a cleaning tool and gets all of the mud off and retouches those colors. And now is more valuable than it had ever been. And now for the first time, it really depicts the return of the prodigal son. And now, whether it is a Rembrandt, whether it is a Monet, whether it is a Van Gogh, whether it is a Da Vinci, this in essence is the message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ how he takes human lives that had incredible supreme value that have been defamed because somebody slashed your reputation. Somebody defaced you, uh, the damage that drugs and alcohol will do to our lives. The dirt, the filth, mud that was ground in. Can you imagine? what life does to us and then how people will discount you because of what you've been through. But you are still who you are. The diamond nature of your character and spirit, wonderfully and fearfully made by God, is still there. The essence of who you are, your creativity is still in your life. Your value is still there just because you got dirty 
doesn't mean that you were devalued. And Jesus, with his own blood, came to our tattered lives. And there, to my heart, was the blood applied. And he put his hands on us and began to heal and bring restoration to every area of where people had spoken against us and where people were determining your value. You never let other human beings set your value because they will always set it too low. They are not your creator. And they'll always judge you for what you have done and for where you have been and for the mistakes that you have made. But God judges us based on our potential and where the future that he has designed for us to go. And it is not until you have been broken that the broken become masters at mending. And when you've gone through brokenness because you've been slashed, now you know how with tender, tenderness and delicacy to take another person's life that has been ripped apart and delicately hold them together and behind the scenes of the canvas sew them back together again. God does the work that, with the hidden person of the heart. He begins to mend in the areas. If you could only see the underside of where the Holy Ghost has been working with a damaged self-esteem, low self-image, to bring restoration to a life that felt useless as though they had messed up and would never be able to measure up to where God could use them and get glory out of their life. But the darker the night, the brighter the light. The darker the background, the greater the glory. The deeper the sin, the greater the mercy. Where sin doth abound, there does the grace of God much more abound. And while other folks were bidding on us to say, well, maybe they can do this little thing and that little thing, God sent his son in to buy us back and to purchase us with his own blood at full value. Even despite the fact that you got pregnant out of wedlock or you were molested or abused, even though you got addicted to drugs or pornography, God will never judge you based on where you've been. God's judgment is in accordance to our humility to say, God, change me. Because when you do, it immediately puts you into the plan of God for a future that becomes glorious, more magnificent than anything that you can imagine or think. It is always above that which you ask or think. When you submit your life to God, and if you're honest with yourself, we know our own limitations, and you'll see what God will have done and where the places that God will have brought you, the people that he will have brought into your life, you'll realize this is nothing but the grace and the glory of God. Bigger than anything that you have the capacity to even dream yourself. God has been favorable to us and you're worth much more in the sight of God than a Rembrandt or a Da Vinci or a Picasso. God is saying that I value you when all of the other curators of the world have assigned a value to you. It is not just about your job. A career is what you're paid for. A calling is what you're made for. And you're so desperately valuable to God that even getting dirty and defiled God by his own grace would go to a prodigal son in a pig pen and find a son and then make him aware of his sin when God made him aware of his sin of rebellion then he came to himself because until you come to yourself you cannot come to God and he came to himself and said I will arise and I will go to my father's house and when he came he just said to his father daddy make me as one of your your hired servants even when he came home in an attitude of humility he said make me when he left home he said give me in arrogance 
in entitlement. Give me the portion of goods that comes to me. Give me my inheritance. Well, when he came back home, he said, make me, make me. I'm like clay in your hand. God, make me, mold me, shape me. I'm yielded this time. When I left, I was arrogant. I knew everything. Give me, give me, give me, give, give me, give me what belongs to me. But he came back. He said, make me. He came back broken and tattered and torn. And the first thing the father said was, bring the best robe. I want to cover you. Love covers. He didn't expose him. He said, I want to cover you. I want to cover your shame, your guilt. I want to cover you. He brought a cover. Bring the shoes. Bring a ring. I'm going to restore you into authority. And he began to restore his identity, his income, and his influence. He said, I want to restore you. Robe, shoes, ring. I want to restore you. And God, who so loves you, wants to restore your life as you surrender to him. When you surrender to him, oh my God, there's such a rest. There's such a peaceful rest. And that rest is always based on a revelation, on a perspective, on a position that God has brought you into an understanding of a promise of his word. And when you get that revelation, your life changes forever. Enter now into the rest of the Lord. Cease from your labor. Cease striving. And just be still and know that He is God. He will be exalted among the heathen. He will be exalted in the earth. He's God. And if you've messed up, and if you've been like that priceless Rembrandt slashed from corner to corner, defaced by alcohol, addictions, disfigured by mud, defamed by shame, the master artist, the God of all aesthetics, is able by the elements which he creates he's also the God who recreates who restores who renews and who rebuilds and right from where you are if you've messed up I lift my voice today like a trumpet and say return to God return to God admit that you need him Sin can only go out of the life by one means, and it's by confession. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and thou shalt be saved. You ask God, Lord, make me aware of my desperate need for you. I need you. And I recognize the provision that you've already purchased for me. You redeemed me. You bought me back while I was worthless. And now the value of the Holy Spirit, the essence of God himself, made in his image after his likeness, restores our psyche, our consciousness, our character. He restores us and renews us like he leads us beside the still waters and restores our soul. God, may we cease from our labors and allow you to do your divine work of restoration, body, mind, soul, and spirit in us from the innermost to the outermost. Be glorified in us, God. And we will be careful to share the good news of what you will have done in us, for us, and through us to the generations to come. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope that you enjoyed that message. 
Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.